In this video, I'm going to cover the solubility constant, molar solubility, and precipitation. So some, I, some compounds, some ionic compounds, we have called insoluble in the past, and some we have said are soluble. We had um, a series of rules. Uh, we said that if they have a carbonate ion, for example, they're generally insoluble. Um, so maybe you remember those rules from chapter four. So um, we, when we say that some compounds are soluble and some are insoluble, what we're saying is that soluble compounds dissolve to a very, very large extent, um, or maybe even to a relatively large extent. But um, insoluble compounds d dissolve, um, don't dissolve any appreciable amount. So an insoluble compound, if we take a scoop of a compound that's not soluble in water and we put it in water, it doesn't seem to the eye as if anything has happened. All of that powder would just sink to the bottom of the, of the flask or the cup or whatever, and it wouldn't look like any of it had mixed up. So in that case, we would call that compound insoluble. But even in that case, some of the compound is dissolving. So all ionic compounds dissolve in water to some extent. Even those that we call insoluble are dissolving a, even a little tiny bit. Um, so some of these compounds have such low solubility that we call them insoluble. And sometimes they are so, their, their solubility is so, so low that it's difficult to even measure the ions that dissolve. But they do dissolve to some extent, even if it's only a one in a trillion or one in a trillion trillion molecules dissolving, um, or even smaller. So we can, since, since that is technically an equilibrium, since some of them dissolve, then we can apply the concepts of equilibrium to these insoluble, the, what we would typically call insoluble compounds. So um, just like equilibrium from chapter 13 and just like equilibrium from chapter 14, when we're talking about equilibrium of acids and bases or equilibrium of anything, when we're trying to calculate the equilibrium constant, we put the products over the reactants. When we're talking specifically about acids, then we, we have what we call the Ka, right? And that's the acid dissociation constant or the acid dissociation product. Um, when we're talking about uh, um, equilibrium in concentration, we have the Kc. When we're talking about equilibrium in pressure, we can call that Kp. But they're all just K, right? And it's always just products over reactants. So KSP is the same. It's just products over reactants. But when we're talking about this specific kind of reaction, a dissociation reaction, that's where I have a solid ionic compound. And that's, and that's the only thing on the left is a solid ionic compound. And on the right are the ions that that compound is composed of. This is um, called a dissociation reaction. And anytime I'm creating an equilibrium constant from a dissociation reaction, I call that KSP. And so if we look at this, we put products here over reactants here. But remember that solids aren't included in a dissociation reaction, or excuse me, in an equilibrium constant. So this is a pure solid. These are aqueous, so they're included. But this is a solid, so it's not included in the equilibrium constant. So the equilibrium constant just ends up looking like this with no, nothing in the denominator. And in fact, because all, all, dis, all KSP equations are derived from these dissociation reactions, and dissociation reactions always have a pure solid on the left as the only thing, the KSP never has a denominator. The KSP is always just this ion times this ion, or if there's three ions, there would be three of them in a row on, uh, in the KSP. So solids aren't included, and solids are the only thing on the left. So let's draw some of the um, dissociation reactions for these ions. So this is a solid here. And there's two sodiums, Na2. So I'll put 2NA, and then I have 1S. Now what are the charges? Do you remember that trick? 
um, I can use the subscript of the cation to tell me what the charge of the anion is, and I can use the subscript of the anion to tell me what the charge of the cation is. So Na2 implies that this is S2 minus, and S1 implies that this is Na plus. Remember another way to determine the, the charge of an ion is to determine where it is on the periodic table. So this would be the dissociation reaction from this ionic compound. This is a solid. These are aqueous. So if we're trying to draw a KSP, we would draw products over reactants, which would be Na plus 2, because uh, the coefficient here is a 2, and S2 minus to the 1 power, because there's um, only this, the coefficient of the S is 1. So let's do that down here too. Um, this is a solid. So again, the reason that the solid's not included is because it's solid, so we don't put it in the KSP. So this would dissociate into Al, and what's the charge on Al? 3 plus aqueous plus this other ion here, OH, in brackets. And what's the charge on OH? Well, we look for the subscript on Al, which is 1. So that tells us that the charge on OH is 1. So my KSP here would be Al3+. plus. Oh, I forgot this coefficient. Oops. There's three OHs, so I need three OH-. minus. So that means I'll have OH- minus here, the concentration of OH- minus here, raised to the third power. The, the coefficient, um, the stoichiometric coefficient becomes the power in the KSP, the exponent in the KSP. Let's do this last one here. So then we have 2 bismuth. And what's the charge on bismuth? 3 plus. This is aqueous. And we we'll have 3 sulfate. So plus 3 sulfate. And that's also aqueous. My KSP for this reaction is 2 bismuth. So Bi 3 plus. and SO4 to minus to the third power. So you see how we take an ionic compound, even if I don't have the reaction, I can take an ionic compound, create a dissociation reaction, and then create a KSP from there. So KSP values because we're talking about compounds that we would generally call insoluble. So remember that if something is insoluble, we're going to say even though everything dissolves a little bit, insoluble things don't dissolve very much. So if we look at a dissociation where I have solid dissolving into ion, cation, and anion, then if we're saying an insoluble compound is one that doesn't dissolve very much, then in this equilibrium, let me draw this as an equilibrium, in this equilibrium, the solid is going to have the majority of the, of the components will be on the solid, and it'll have only a very small amount of the things that have dissolved. So when I'm talking about the KSP, and we're looking at these ions, and this is the cation times the anion, and insoluble compounds are only going to have very small amounts of cation and anion, then we're talking about KSP values that are very, very small. They're always going to be negative exponents because if we're talking about soluble compounds, then we're generally not interested in um, doing a KS, doing a solubility analysis because if I start off with one molar one mole of sodium chloride, I'm going to make one molar sodium chloride solution for something that's very soluble. But if I start off with one mole of aluminum hydroxide and I dissolve solid one mole of solid aluminum hydroxide in water 
and this is the KSP, I am not going to get one mole of dissolved KS of one one mole of dissolved aluminum hydroxide. So what will the solute what will the concentration of that solution be? Well, I have to do an ice table and I have to use my KSP to figure it out. So uh, there's a couple of terms that we're going to run into here that are very similar um, both in their terminology and in the way that they're applied, but they're different. And we have to be careful. We have to be on the lookout to not try not mix these up. So solubility is the amount of solute that will dissolve in a given amount of solvent at a particular temperature. So we're talking about the amount of solid compound. So I go to the, the chemical closet and I have a bunch of different solid powders in jars and the solubility is if I have a liter of water how much of each of those powders is going to dissolve in a liter right so grams per liter one gram per liter 10 grams per liter 100 grams per liter the solubility we're talking about the amount of solid compound and a solid compound if I'm talking about sodium chloride the amount that I dissolve in water has mass from the sodium and the chloride and so solubility has different units, grams per liter, and we're talking about cations and anions generally. The molar solubility is the number of moles of solute that will dissolve in a liter of solution. So this sounds fairly similar, and, they, and that's why they're easy to get mixed up. Um, the molarity of the dissolved solute in a saturated solution. So the, the, when a solute is a solid compound, it contains N, A, and C, L. But when a, sol, a solute is dissolved, then it contains N, A plus and C, L minus. And so if I have one mole of solid sodium chloride and I dissolve that in one liter of water, then I'm going to have one mole per liter of sodium and one mole per liter of chloride. So um, that means that uh, each of um, I had I could say about that solution that sodium is the concentration of sodium is one molar. And I could also say about that solution that the concentration of chloride is one molar. So sometimes when we're talking about this, since it's one molar in both of these substances, we can talk about the activity of the solution and say the activity of the solution is two molar because there's one molar sodium and one molar chloride. So when I'm talking about a solid compound, I'm, I'm always the solubility is always given in grams per liter and I'm talking about both components. I'm, I'm putting a scoop of this in. I can't help but, but keep them together. I can't separate sodium and chloride in a solid compound. But when they're dissolved and I have one molar sodium and one molar chloride, the molar solubility is only, all right, when I make my ice table here and I'm, I, my change is going to be plus x and plus x on my ice table because it's a one to one molar ratio. The molar solubility is only concerned with one of these x's. So it's a, it's a minor point, but it's something that helps when we're trying to solve some of these problems. Is that um, I'd, even though I'm going to solve my ice table and there will be a cation that has some value for C, and there will be an anion that has some value for C, when I'm trying to solve for the molar solubility, all I care about is x. This could be, for example, 3x and this could be for example 2x and the answer to which of them is the molar solubility neither the molar solubility is 1x 1x so you'll see what I mean in a minute when we actually solve some of these problems but the solubility of a compound how much solid stuff will dissolve in water is different than the molar solubility which is what is the the uh, the molarity of the dissolved solute when the sat when the solution is saturated. So let's look at that. So if I have an ice table, make an ice table for this one.
then I don't care about the solid. Solids don't figure into the equilibrium, so they don't, I don't need them in the ice table. Initially, I'm going to start with pure water, so I have zero. Um, my change is going to be uh, dependent on my stoichiometry, which is 2, so this will be plus 2x. And remember, what we're talking about is taking some of this solid stuff, a scoop of this solid stuff, and scooping it into water, and it's going to dissolve. And when it dissolves, it breaks into these two. So I'm saying that I'm going to always be adding. It's always going to be plus 2x or plus x or plus 3x on this side because I'm always... I'm, it's, everything is always dissolving a little bit, so it's always going to be plus. I, never, I don't have to worry about Q in these kind of problems, whether this is plus 2x or minus 2x. It's always plus 2x when we're talking about solubility problems. Alright, so then on this side I have plus 3x. So 0 plus 2x is just 2x. 0 plus 3x is just 3x. So my Ksp is the equilibrium concentration of bismuth 3 plus and at equilibrium my concentration is going to be 2x so 2x but remember that this is already squared so it'll be 2x squared and my equilibrium concentration of sulfate is going to be 3x but remember this concentration was already cubed so I can't drop the cube so it's 2x squared, 3x cubed. This 2 right here appears twice in my Ksp. It appears right here as the coefficient, and it appears right here again as the exponent. OK, so um, now let's try to solve for x. Let's solve for the molar solubility here. So to solve for x, I have to combine these terms. So 2x squared is 4x squared. And 3x cubed is 27x cubed. And 4 times 27 is 108x to the fifth. So let's see, I've got this table. So in a table, you can look up these values in a table, and I found that the KSP is 6.68 6 times 10 to the negative 13 equals 108x to the fifth. So if I want to isolate x, I'll divide both sides by, five, by 108. Then I get 6. 1, 8 times 10 to the negative 15 equals x to the fifth. And then if we take the fifth root of each side, then that will give us x. So if you don't know how to calculate the fifth root on your calculator, you probably have a button that looks like this, x, y. And so you'll get the value that you want under the, um, under the radical sign. So we've got that, cal that value in our calculator right now, 6.18 times 10 to the negative 15. Then you're going to push this button on your calculator then you're going to push 5. All right, so that gives us 0 0.001439 molar. So that is our molar solubility.
So we can go from Ksp to the molar solubility. Okay, so again, molar solubility is related to Ksp, and we can calculate the molar solubility if we're given the Ksp, and we can calculate the Ksp if we're given the molar solubility. And we can also calculate the Ksp if we're given the solubility in grams per liter, although we're going to have to take an extra step and convert that to moles. So um, although the, the solubility is related to Ksp, we can't always compare solubilities of compounds by comparing their Ksp values. So to compare Ksp values, they have to have the same dissociation constant or the same dissociation stoichiometry, I mean. And so what, what I mean by that is if we look at these two examples down here, we might, the, we might be asked which compound has the highest molar solubility. And by highest molar solubility, we're saying which one is going to have the uh, solution of the highest concentration at equilibrium. So which one will be the most soluble? So when I look at these, when I think about most soluble, I would say, well, the one that has the largest equilibrium constant is going to be the most soluble because it's going to have the highest amount of products, the highest ratio of products to reactants at equilibrium. That's what KSP, oops, that's what KSP means. So in this case, that's not actually true because we have to look at how many ions are created when this compound, uh, when this compound dissociates. So the number of ions that are created when a compound dissociates um, affects the Ksp value and it affects the molar solubility. So in this case, when calcium carbonate dissolves, I have one calcium and one carbonate. So one mole of calcium carbonate gives me one mole of calcium and one mole of carbonate. So two moles total. But up here, one mole of barium arsenate gives me three moles of barium and two moles of arsenate. So for every one mole of this compound, I get five moles of ions. So there are five over two times more ions that dissolve when one mole of this compound dissolves. And so that more than accounts for the fact that this KSP is smaller. So we can look at that math here. So barium arsenate, if we draw the dissociation reaction for barium arsenate, I'd have three barium with a two plus charge and two arsenate with a three plus charge or excuse me a three minus charge we're considering that we're dissolving these in pure water so zero barium ions to start zero arsenate ions to start the change is plus 3x the change is plus 2x so these will be my equilibrium values my KSP is 1.1 times 10 to the negative 13 that was in the in the question so we're trying to calculate x to see which x is going to be a bigger number here. That tells us which of these compounds has a higher molar solubility. So when I, when I make Ksp, this is going to be 3x cubed times 2x squared. So this is just like the one we just did, 105, 108 times uh, x to the fifth. So we put Ksp over 108, take the fifth root, we get 1 times 10 to the negative 3 molar. When we do the same thing with calcium carbonate, I get one calcium and one carbonate, so plus x and plus x, so x and x, so Ksp equals x squared. See up here, Ksp is equal to 108 times x to the fifth. Here, Ksp is only equal to x squared. So I take the square root of Ksp instead of the fifth root, and that gives us an x that's actually smaller. So what that means is that my, the concentration of calcium in this solution is actually going to be smaller than the concentration of barium in this solution, even though the KSP is smaller for barium arsenate. So we can't directly compare KSP values and talk about um, solubility. We have to also look at the stoichiometry of the reaction because that affects the math.
Okay, so we have been at, up to this point assuming that we're dissolving a scoop of insoluble compound in pure water. So the I part of our ice table is always zero, but that's not always the case. We have what's called um, common, the common ion effect. So if I'm trying to dissolve an insoluble salt, or even if I'm trying to dissolve a soluble salt, if I'm trying to dissolve anything in pure water, then there's nothing to get in the way. But if I'm trying to dissolve a solution of lead, if I'm trying to dissolve lead chloride in water, in a or in a solution of sodium chloride, then the lead chloride has a harder time dissolving because there's sodium chloride is already in the solution, and there's already chloride in that solution. So, essentially, when lead chloride dissolves, the amount of lead and chloride that dissolves is related to the KSP. Um, if there's already chloride in solution, then that chloride is already affecting the amount of lead that can dissolve from this compound. Or another way to think about it is if I have a solution of lead chloride and I add chloride to it, what's going to happen? Well, by Le Chatelier's principle, if I add chloride to that solution, if I add to this side, then the equilibrium is going to push the reaction this way. So that means if I add chloride to a solution of lead chloride, it's going to cause more solid to form, which means it's going to precipitate. So um, the common ion effect says that anytime I'm trying to create a solution with an ion that's a, a solution of an ion, with an ion that's already in that solution, so example, lead chloride in a sodium chloride solution, then it's harder for that lead chloride to dissolve. The lead chloride will be less soluble. So um, the addition of a soluble salt that contains one of the ions of the insoluble salt decreases the solubility of the insoluble salt. That's a better way to say it. So let's look at an example of that. What is the molar solubility of calcium fluoride in a 0 0.11 or 0 0.10 molar solution of sodium fluoride? So we just looked at what is the molar solubility of calcium fluoride or something like it, right? This is, we, d we solve for x. Molar solubility is x. What is the molar solubility? Well, if we look up KSP in a table, we can solve for x assuming that we're dissolving this in pure water. But now, what is the molar solubility of calcium fluoride in a solution that's not pure water? Well, what is a solution of sodium fluoride? Sodium and fluoride. So if I have a one molar solution of sodium fluoride, or 0 0.1, that means that I have 0.1 molar sodium and 0.1 molar fluoride. So what happens when calcium fluoride dissolves this solid? Well, I will make calcium ions and two fluoride ions. So when I make my ice table, I'm trying to determine the, the molar solubility of calcium fluoride. How much calcium do I have in the solution initially? Remember, we don't have to consider the solid. So how much calcium do I have initially? Zero. There is zero calcium in a solution of sodium fluoride. But how much fluoride do I have initially? Not zero. 0.1 molar. What's the change? Plus x. What's the change? Plus 2x. So here I have x, and here I have 0 0.1 molar plus plus 2x. So look up, we look up the uh, value of calcium fluoride, the KSP value of calcium fluoride. I have that here. 4 times 10 to the negative 11. This is uh, also in your, in your textbook at the end in Appendix J, solubility products, a whole list of them. Calcium fluoride. So KSP equals 4.0 times 10 to the negative 11. 
and our equilibrium constant equation takes the form of Ca2 plus times F minus squared. So this is going to be calcium is x. F minus is 0 0.1 molar plus 2x squared. So when I have a, an ion already in solution, then that affects the math of the KSP. So it's going to affect my solubility. So let's solve this problem down here. So KSP equals 4.0 times 10 to the negative 11. Okay, so then when we look at the other half of the equation here, and um, we see that this, uh, this term is squared. So generally to solve this equation, I would write this term twice, and we'd have to apply FOIL, right? And I do first, and then outer, and then inner, and then last. And we put them all together, and then we would multiply here. Um, but to make all of this math a lot easier, what we can do is just apply the same reasoning that we applied uh, with the acid dissociation constant, which is that if I am adding, uh, if, if I can assume that x is very, very small, and I'm adding a number to it that's fairly big, and much bigger than this number would be, then 0.1 plus a really small number is pretty much equal to 0.1. So the math becomes much easier if we can ignore this x and assume that this x is going to be small. So in that case, what I really have on this side is x and 0 0.1 molar squared. So 0 0.1 squared times x is 0 0.01x. So x equals 4.0 times 10 to the negative 11 divided by 0 0.01. So um, the, we can see that the, the molar solubility uh, in 0.1 molar solution, 0.1 molar sodium fluoride solution is 4 times 10 to the negative 9. And if this were a 0, then this, would, this number would be larger. we can solve that problem really quickly. What we could do is say if we had KSP is equal to x and 2x squared, then that would be x times 4x squared, which would equal 4x cubed. So x would be equal to the cube root of KSP divided by 4. So KSP 4 times 10 to the negative 11 divided by 4 cubed root. So here x equals 2.15 times 10 to the negative 4 molar. So when there is no, when I'm trying to dissolve calcium fluoride in pure water, then the solution I can get uh, 2.15 times 10 to the negative 4 molar calcium. But if I'm trying to dissolve calcium fluoride in a 0.1 molar solution of sodium fluoride, then I can only get a 4 times 10 to the negative 9 molar solution of calcium. So you can see how having that common ion in here when this is not 0, when this starts as a number instead of 0, it affects the solubility. It decreases the solubility.
So we can also affect the solubility not only by adding um, ions that are part of the equilibrium, but we can affect the solubility uh, by adding uh, P by adding H plus, so decreasing the pH, adding protons, or adding OH minus, increasing the pH by adding a base. So even if those uh, ions are not part of the equilibrium, they can still have some effect on the equilibrium. So here in this example, if I have aluminum hydroxide or sodium hydroxide or some metal hydroxide, any metal, um, then if I ha add hydroxide to a solution of sodium hydroxide, then the hydroxide will go in here and push the reaction this way by Le Chatelier's principle, which will precipitate my sodium hydroxide, and that will decrease its solubility. So, but that's that's the common ion effect. So if I if I add o, if I add base to a solution that's basic, it it will decrease the solubility of whatever hydroxide that is. Um, However, if I add acid to this solution, if I add H plus to this solution, then H plus will react with my OH minus. And if I react with OH minus, I'm essentially removing this from the solution. And if I remove this from the solution, the Le Chatelier's principle pushes this reaction forward and more of my hydroxide dissolves. So adding an acid will effectively remove the base and removing the base drives the reaction forward by Le Chatelier's principle. So uh, if changing the pH can affect the solubility of certain compounds. So acid increases the solubility of weak bases. Remember that most anions are weak bases. The only exceptions are um, amphoteric anions. And remember, amphoteric means things that are both acids and bases. So this is actually a base, but it's also an acid because it has H plus on it. And this is a base because it's an anion, it can accept H plus, but it's also an acid because it has H, another H plus to give. So these are amphoteric, they're acids and bases. They might um, not actually be basic when you put them in water. So these are examples of anions that when you put them in water, they might cause the, the solution to become acidic because they actually have H pluses to donate as well. Um, it, we, it depends on whether they're more acidic or more basic, since they're both. Another example of anions that aren't necessarily weak bases, or in fact that these, these are definitely not weak bases, are the conjugate bases of strong acids. These are neutral. So remember, um, HCl is a strong acid, so Cl- is a neutral ion. It's not, as, it's not acidic or basic. HBr is a strong acid, so Br- is not acidic or basic. It's completely neutral. So for all the strong acids, their conjugate bases are completely neutral. They're not, acid, they're not acids or bases. So ionic compounds that have weak base anions, which again is almost all of them. These are some rare exceptions. Most ionic compounds are actually more soluble in acidic solution because most anions are bases. And if I react a base with uh, an acid, then the base will be removed from the equilibrium, and Le Chatelier's principle will drive that equilibrium forward. And conversely, a base will increase the solubility of weak acids. So most cations are neutral, and some exceptions are ammonium, which is NH4+, that's a weak acid, and metal ions with a charge that are, that's plus three or greater. So those are weak acids as well. So if we have an insoluble compound whose cation is a weak acid, then adding a base to that solution will make the, the weak acid compound more soluble. Because the, again, the base will react with the acid, remove the acid from the equilibrium, and that will drive the reaction forward by Le Chatelier's principle. So finally, um, anything that drives a reaction forward, a solubility reaction forward, will increase the solubility. It will cause whatever solid is in that solution to dissolve even more. However, anything that causes the equilibrium to move backwards toward the reaction will cause more solid to be formed. And when more solid is formed in a reaction, we call that precipitation. So let's go back and look at, at a reaction here. So when I'm looking at 
uh, a dissociation reaction. If I can drive the reaction forward like this, then more is dissolving. The solid is turning, the, the solid is decreasing. It's turning into dissolved ions. But anything that drives the equilibrium this way is causing more solid to be formed. And when more solid is formed, that's called a precipitation. So how do I know if a precipitation is going to occur if I add two solutions together? Well, if I add together um, two ions that are that make a compound that we would call insoluble that has a very very small KSP then those compound those ions will meet and they'll precipitate from solution so for example we would say that barium sulfate is insoluble which again remember that doesn't mean that it doesn't dissolve at all it means that it only dissolves a little tiny bit so we'll call barium sulfate insoluble so if I mixed a solution of barium chloride and a solution of sodium sulfate together, barium sulfate would precipitate because it's insoluble. The barium and the sulfate would meet and they would precipitate from that solution. So how do I know if two solutions mixed are going to create a precipitate? Well, first I have to know if there's an insoluble compound in there. Will a compound be formed that has a very small KSP? And once that, if I have determined that that's true, then I just have to figure out what is the amount of each. If I have put in one mole of barium and I have two moles of sulfate, then I'll have some sulfate left over. If I have two moles of barium and one mole of sulfate in that solution, then I'll have some barium left over after they, uh, after they precipitate. So. I can always calculate Q and determine if two solutions are going to precipitate when mixed. And Q is the reaction quotient, which is, has the same format as K, um, but we don't know if the concentrations involved are equilibrium concentrations. So if we're given two concentrations and the question says, will a solution of 0.001 molar calcium fluoride and 0.02 molar barium sulfate result in a precipitate, well then we would put those, those concentrations into the reaction quotient equation, Q, and see if Q equaled K, then we'd say, okay, that reaction is at equilibrium, no precipitation. If Q was smaller than K, then we'd say the solution is unsaturated, no precipitation. But if Q is greater than K, then we'd say, okay, that solution is above saturation because remember K is the saturation point, so if Q is greater than K, then we're going to create a precipitate until those equilibrium concentrations equal K, the saturation point. So generally, um, we can determine if a precipitate is going to be formed by determining what the KSP of all of the, of the resulting compounds is going to be, and then calculating the molarity of the solutions involved and seeing if Q, what the relationship of Q to K. So here's an example. Um, here's sodium chromate here. It's obviously dissolved. It's dissolved because I can see right through it. it. It's yellow, but since it's translucent, which means it's not cloudy, it's very clear, that means it's dissolved. Down here in the, the clear solution is silver nitrate. So this is not water down here. It's silver nitrate. And again, it's a little bit cloudy, so silver nitrate is not terribly soluble, but it's fairly clear. You can, you can pretty much see right through the solution too. So when a solution is clear, we say that that compound is soluble. When I mix the sodium chromate and the silver nitrate together, I make silver chromate. And silver chromate is insoluble. So you see how it becomes, soluble, it becomes cloudy when those two are mixed. The cloudy part is a precipitate. The clear parts are solutions. So this looks like a lot of silver nitrate down here. I just put in maybe three drops of, of sodium chromate. So yes, some silver chromate was formed, but there's still probably some silver left in the solution because I only added a little bit of chromate and there was a lot of silver down here to begin with. So we can figure out how much silver is left in the reaction by taking that into account. Or I can figure out how much chromate is left in the reaction if this were the other way around and I was dripping the silver into the sodium chromate. So a supersaturated solution is one that has um, more uh, solute 
than this than the saturation level. So we talked about this back in chapter four as well. You, you might remember. Um, and so soup, we make a super saturated solution by heating a solvent up. And when solvents are hot, they can accept more solute. So we make a boiling solvent and we dissolve as much solute as we can possibly dissolve in that boiling sol solvent. And when it cools down, it still is holding all of that solute in there. But as it cools, it's no longer capable of dissolving as much. The solubility decreases for, sol for solvents that are cold than for solvents that are hot. So this, so this boiling solution had a lot of solute dissolved in it, and as it cools down, that solute is still dissolved. We call that supersaturated. So a supersaturated solution is unstable, and if we add a crystal, or even sometimes if we just flick this, or even if we scratch the vessel, or any kind of um, uh, add, adding a little bit of energy to get this over the activation barrier will cause uh, crystallization or precipitation to occur. So there's lots of solute in this solvent that wants to come out because there's more solute than is allowed. And if we give it a little extra energy to get over the activation barrier, suddenly all of that solute will precipitate. All of the solute will come out and we call that recrystallization. And it comes out really quickly because the solution was unstable. It was as su being super saturated, the solvent wasn't technically capable of dissolving that much solute. It was holding more solute than it wanted.